Okay, let's talk about master keying and how it reduces security. So everything we've done up to this point is based on total position progression when we're uh, employing a specific method of progression. That means total position progression literally by definition does mean there'll be a master pin in every chamber, uh, every single chamber. So here's an exercise. Assume a six pin lock is, is operated by two keys, a change key and a master key. To make this possible one way is to have a bottom pin and a master pin in each chamber. And what I mean by one way is a reference to methods of progression. One of the methods of progression that you can employ to make this work is total position progression, which is what we're using for now. In this scenario, how many keys work this cylinder? The obvious answer is two, but that is wrong. Perhaps the question is more fairly asked, how many total keys work this cylinder? The correct answer is startling to most people if they answer incorrectly the first time. Generally, people in that class answered three times uh, and then still just went along with the answer given at the end. And it's completely excusable and understandable. If you don't, before you're asked that question, you don't possess, quite frankly, a bit more advanced knowledge of locksmithing, you're not, you're not gonna know the answer because you you just don't know. You don't know yet, but after you are taught why that's the case, you then know exactly why it is, and you can calculate it for any condition. The correct answer is 64 keys operate that cylinder, and if that shocks you, it should, um, though I can prove why they work. If it's shocking, it should be shocking, but I can prove it. How did we pick up the additional 62 keys working the cylinder when we only wanted two. These additional 62 keys are called incidental keys and allow me to show you where they come from. In this example, we're using our same 10 depth, two step progression, a max of seven. Let's say the TMK is our friendly 470529. In the first change key you would uh, encounter in progressing this in a typical way in a KBA would be 692741. Now here's our pinning chart. Pinning chart, I'm just gonna jump here. Pinning chart is a new term we're in, we are introducing. It simply tells us what pins to drop into the plug when we are combinating the cylinder. It is a cheat sheet. Um, and if you're doing a level two or a level three and you've got the key numbers written in front of you, you're not gonna create a pinning chart necessarily to pin those. You're just going to look at the three different biddings and you know, you're going to choose the shallowest cut first and then go to the next shallowest and then go to the next shallowest. You'll go from shallow to deep and you know, you're going to use a bottom pin for that shallow cut and then master pins to make up the difference. Whether it be schlag or it be, you know, it's the same concept. If even if you're pinning master ring, it's the same concept. Pinning charts will come in um, when you are pinning more complicated cylinders like master ring or obviously small format. And if you're pinning small format or master ring, you might just build yourself a fancy Excel formula for calculating that. You know, you can, you can tell your formula, your change key, your master key and your um, control key and let it calculate all the pins for you. It's really easy to do that for small format. And you're gonna know by the time you pin the first chamber and then the first cylinder whether or not your formula works because the key will either work, all the keys will either work or they won't. Um, so when we pin a job of small format, if it's a large enough job, I'll sit there and create pinning charts for my locksmith who will actually combinate the cylinders, uh, meaning one of the internal employees who will do it. Um, and if it's just level two or level three stuff, it's just what are the three different keys that have to work that cylinder and you do it in your head. So I wanted to just, just define this new term. So the pinning chart just tells us what pins to drop. Um, a pinning chart does not generally include a driver pin. 
unless you're working in a system that specifies the height of the driver pin so as to have a balanced amount of pressure on the spring or unless you're doing interchangeable core uh, such as best which is the same reason you have to have a uniform uh, pin stack but a Schlage F-lock that you can buy at Home Depot is also going to have balanced drivers. There are three different driver sizes for Schlage. Nobody ever changes them, but the manual tells you what they are. If you've got pins one, uh, 0 through 3, four, uh, or maybe it's 0 to one, uh, 2, 3 to uh, 6, 7 to 9, you'll use different length drivers. Like I said, no one that I really know of changes those, but you should. Um, that's the correct way to do it. So a, a, a Generally, a pinning chart won't include the driver if, you, if you're not dealing with changing the drivers, but if you are, you would definitely have the driver in there as well. So, as you look at the pinning chart, 470521, that's almost our master key. If it seems strange that almost all the bottom pins are the TMK, it's only because the first change key in the KBA would be 692741. Um, it's just the way the math worked out um, that, you know, this is the pinning chart. There's nothing unusual about this. Um, here's what the KBA would look like for this. And I've just used a sequence of progression that I've used, and we're going to talk about that next. So back to the initial question, how many keys will pass or work this lock? Again, the answer is 64, but let's look closer. We know these two keys work, and we can see that from the pinning chart. A 6... Uh, a, a 9, a 2, a 7, a 4, and a 9 will work. But what's interesting, though, to kind of give away the lead, 222228, two, 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 that key would work this. Um, I'm sorry, that key would not work this. What I meant to say was 470521 will work that cylinder. Now, neither of our keys are 470521, but you can see... A key that satisfies all the bottom pins will work. 470528, I'm sorry, 470529, that's going to work. 470541, that's going to work. 470549, that's going to work. And if I keep on going through all six chambers, you start to see where the problem is. Because we have a master pin in every chamber, an additional 62 keys work. How so? The reason is because in every chamber, you have two combinations that will satisfy the requirements of that one chamber. Therefore, two keys will work in that one, fa uh, one chamber. Let's ease into it. Imagine you have a one-pin chamber lock. And if, it, if it's helpful, keep this core pinning chart up somewhere so you can look at it. Um, but just to, you know, a, if we have a one pin lock, a, a one chamber lock, a key that's cut four and a key that's cut six are both going to work there, right? You agree with that, hopefully. If Imagine you have a one pin chamber lock. If you have a bottom pin only, one key will work the lock. But if you add a master pin, now two keys will operate this one pin chamber lock. That's easy to understand. Imagine you have a two chamber lock and that you have added a chamber to your existing one chamber lock. Okay, now you have a two chamber lock. These are imaginary. The second chamber will also have a bottom pin and a master pin. That means in the second chamber, it alone can satisfy um, two keys. But you inherit the first two keys that the first chamber can satisfy. So our two-pin chamber lock can satisfy a four or a seven. It can satisfy a four and a nine. It can satisfy a six and a seven. And it can satisfy a six and a nine. There's four keys will work in a two-pin chamber lock when you have a master and a bottom pin in each chamber. Okay. Now, because you have the two keys that will work in the first chamber and now two additional keys that will work because of the added second chamber, you now have two times two equals four keys that will work 
in this two pin chamber lock. If we add a third chamber to our lock with again a bottom pin and a master pin, again an additional two keys that would operate the third chamber, we now have two keys that operate from the first chamber multiplied by two keys that will operate from the second chamber multiplied by two keys that will operate because of the third chamber and it becomes 2 times 2 times 2 equals 8. And if we go back to our uh, pinning chart 470 will work, 472 will work, um, 492 will work, um, 670 will work, 690 will work, uh, 6, uh, I forget where I am, 672 will work, and if you cycle through, and then two, and then 692 will work, 470 will work, I may have gotten to 8, but if you worked all those out, it's going to be 8. If we carry this logic through to all 6 chambers, you're going to have 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 times 2, 64 keys. For the sake of showing the list of all keys, to do so in a way perhaps that will be shocking, gosh, all the client asked for was a change key and a master key. But does the client realize they are getting an additional 62 incidentals or incidental keys? Perhaps referred to, uh, pardon me, sometimes referred to as ghost keys that come along and operate the cylinder as well. This is an upsell opportunity to restricted, patented platforms. Uh, and, the, uh, and the reason of that is the only way that you can exploit this, and we're going to make a really cool deep dive into an upcoming chapter called the Dayton Method, and I'm, show, I'm going to show you an exploit, the exploit for this, physically show you the exploit. I've decided to list all the keys, and here they are. Here are 64. These are all 64 keys that will work this pinning chart. I don't think I've made any mistakes, but nonetheless, they're listed here. Now, I've talked about uh, recognizing patterns, and um, you know, if you study this, you'll see patterns. But that'll be—we'll talk about that shortly. The additional master pin in every chamber creates two possible combinations in each chamber. If it is still a stretch to get to 64 keys, let's, pre uh, let's press on. Before we do, the two keys we intended to work this cylinder are called the TMK and the change key. Both will have SKCS symbols applied to them, but there is no significance in that, in stating that. Of the two, when we make these work by having one master pin in every chamber, we inherit the 62 extra keys. And I'm just summarizing here. Think of it as, as I said, 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 times 2, times two or 2 to the 6th. Two shear lines in six chambers. That's your formula. Now, now, if you had seven chambers, but you didn't have two shear lines in every chamber, you might have one shear line in a chamber. You might have three shear lines. You could do one to the seventh um, plus two to the fourth plus three. You know, you could you could break it up that way as well. Those extra 62 hangers on, we call incidental keys, ghost keys again. Said another way, 1.56% of all possible theoretical keys in the KBA will pass the cylinder when we only wanted 0.05%. That is a huge increase. You know, a, a factor of 30. Um, 31. Again, this can be expressed as 2 to the 6th. This comes from assigning both of the two potential combinations per chamber with six chambers. If you have a five pin cylinder, there are two to the fifth or 30 incidental keys beyond the two we need. So a total of 32. And it gets worse if you have a seven pin cylinder. It's 128 that will work, 126 plus the two that you want to work. When the wrong key works the lock, key interchange occurs. Cylinders with more master pins loaded than necessary makes the cylinder easy to pick, bump, decode, and does so substantially, and does substantially so. And we're going to exploit that very soon. The point is, be aware of what happens when you're dumping master pins. We will talk at length on a very advanced subject 
soon called Methods of Progression, and it will show better ways to progress cylinders so that you're not picking up or you're minimizing the number of incidentals. You want to do that. It is part of the ANSI standard to create a system that minimize the amount of additional keys or, or ghost keys that would work. It's literally in the standard. To, do, to write something in total position progression, you don't go to methods of progression jail. You're just not doing it the way that the ANSI standard tells us to do it or mandates us to do it. And this is, in fact, how master keying reduces key security. It is plain as day. All we want are two different keys to pass a cylinder, and we get an additional 62 in this six-pin example. This loss of security cannot be minim minimized when using TPP, but we will explain ways this loss of security can be minimized by using different means to progress our KBA later when we discuss methods of progression. Speaking of decoding, um, which I'm thinking that I've mentioned here when I was talking about exploits, um, an upcoming chapter discusses a topic well known in the locksmithing industry and is, or was, at least until the early 2000s, the best kept secret contained within the locksmithing industry. It really was. But you, can, but, but you as an expert, can maximize your client's security needs and your profitability as well by understanding how conventional cylinders have, have a weakness which can be exploited rather easily with just a little bit of knowledge. It's really, as, a, as an aside, it's really interesting to be in a locksmithing class uh, because you'll have lots of different types of locksmiths. You'll have retail guys. You'll have guys that do automotive. You'll have people that work on small projects. You'll have people that are quite advanced. You'll have locksmiths that are institutional locksmiths, and they work at a Big Ten university. And some of the stories that they share, the anonymous stories they share, of how brilliant these students are about learning how to exploit exploit the cylinders is really shocking. Um, a little bit of knowledge will allow a smart person to really have their way with a cylinder. If I told you I could decode your TMK bidding with only one working key and some key blanks, would that be of any concern to you or your client? So what I'm doing here is setting up a chapter that will come very soon. If I told you that I could figure out your master key, if I had a working key for the cylinder and I had some key blanks, and I had a method, obviously, of cutting them, and I knew how to cut them, would you, would you or your client, obviously, the importance here is your client, would your client be concerned about that? They may not. Uh, that's certainly possible. I'm not worried about somebody breaking in. I have an alarm. Sure, of course, so do I. Um, other people would say, you know what, now that I know that, it, that there's an exploit, an easy exploit, I think I need to do something about it. Um, and I'm guessing, yes, of course it would be. What follows is, what follows shortly is an outline of this exploit. What follows allows you to understand this exploit. What follows is a uh, better uh, a better way to sec secure your client's best interests and your own through profitability. Before we get to the exploit and proving how Master King reduces security, I just want to shoehorn sequence of progression in here. I just want to talk about what the SOP is, then we're going to get to a fun chapter. So let's continue on. Now, you know, in summary, why you really want to know about this, in my opinion, is because you want to be able to be a good steward over your client's uh, goals what they're spending their money on, you're the expert. Um, <clears throat> once you learn that Master King reduces security, you can then realize, well, we need to minimize this. You want to position yourself of taking that stewardship and navigating the client through an area that, let's face it, they have likely no time or desire to understand the inner nuances of locksmithing, but you 
as someone who is setting up the system can correctly choose a tack to get you to the right safe harbor, so to speak, um, when it comes to how the science of the job will be done when it comes to pinning the cylinders. The factory is going to do a lot of that work, if not all of it. They will be most likely observing best practices when it comes to this. But when you learn about this topic, you can then insert yourself into the conversation and say, explain to me how you plan on doing this. So you can make sure that it's the way that you figure along with the factory is going to be the absolute best way for the client to have their needs met. And obviously a way to sell them a product or a service that does not permit all of these hangers on, these ghost and incidental keys, these easily exploitable uh, points of weakness that's being designed into the system. The chapter very soon is going to show that. And just as you're watching it, be mindful to say to yourself, yeah, we need to get onto a system that's not going to be easy like this to exploit. So here we go. Let's carry on.